Hello and greetings. I'm Gerd Leonhard, Futurist in Zurich, Switzerland. It's my great pleasure to give a short presentation today to your unashamed ethical event in South Africa and globally. And I will talk to you briefly about why ex ethics are existential for our future. First, let's define ethics. Ethics is knowing the difference between having the power or the right to do something and to do what is the right thing to do. This is Supreme Court Judge uh, Potter, a long time ago, like 80 years ago, defining what ethics is, right? The difference between having the power to do something and by choosing to do the right thing. Right? That reminds me very much of the Facebook discussion about why we're doing things. And another headline here is basically that technology always has that dual piece to it, right? It can be good or it can be bad. Technology is morally neutral until we use it. You can take a hammer and if you're a carpenter, you can build a house or you can kill somebody. You can take artificial intelligence and kill people. You can take genetic engineering and maybe solve cancer or kill people and build super soldiers. So here's the most important thing about ethics. Technology drives our societies and science, of course, as well. But ethics define our society. And when I speak about ethics, I don't mean religion or beliefs. I talk about very fundamental ethical values. And if you're looking on a global level, 99% of these ethics and values are somewhat the same, regardless of where you live. For example, wanting to have a better world for your children, wanting to have self-realization, wanting to have the right for a job and freedom and those kind of things. Right. So this is a really important topic defining our future. We are, in fact, in the next year, at a fork in the road with technology. We're growing exponentially fast, whether it's about big data or cloud computing, the Internet of Things and all that stuff that will make your head spin, including blockchain and 3D printing. Right? Technology is growing exponentially fast. And what's happening, of course, here is the big challenge. As technology is growing exponential, humans are not. I mean, we're still linear. You know, we're not going to be putting a chip on our head anytime soon, even though Elon Musk is promising that. Uh, we are still limited by our biological organic setup. We're getting older, we're getting faster, but not like technology. Significant challenge for us, we are at the pivot point of this exponential change. Let's not pretend for a minute that 20 years ago we didn't have these issues, but they were smaller, they were slower. And now technology is changing our world gradually, then suddenly. Look at 3D printing, look at self-driving cars, look at language translation, uh, look at social media uh, manipulation, look at all these things around us. I mean, social media has created 10 million new jobs uh, in the last eight years. <laughs> I mean, exponential change. Let's not pretend for a minute that this is going to be stoppable in some way. We need to figure out, as we're building this kind of new meta-intelligence, how to control it. How will we live in a world where artificial intelligence and genome editing and machine learning is the new normal? Well, we're going to control it by agreeing on what is the right thing to do, just like we did with nuclear weapons or genetic engineering in the past. And that's going to take a consensus that says it's important to be human. It's important to build a world that makes a difference. Great quote here um, that I want to show you from Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, who talks about why this issue is so important. So this is Tim Cook about roughly two years ago, I think European Commission event. Those of us who believe in technology's potential for good must not shrink from this moment. Now more than ever, as leaders of governments, as decision makers in business, and as citizens, we must ask ourselves a fundamental question. What kind of world do we want to live in? Yeah, so that is the crucial question. What kind of world do we want to live in? It can't be the world that is dominated by technology just because technology exists. It has to be a world that is fit for humans, fit for the planet, fit for purpose, a larger story, not a world that just does whatever is possible just because it's possible. And how we're we going to achieve that? Well, we're going to need a sort of a council of wise people like we had in ancient Greece. And that already exists in Denmark and Singapore and many other places. 
We need a digital ethics council in countries, in companies, and in continents, like a pan-African digital ethics council to figure out what is the right thing to do with technology. What is something that we should be doing because it's beneficial and something we shouldn't be doing. For example, autonomous weapons that can kill by themselves. Clearly, that's not a very good idea. We need to find rules on this. And I think that is, of course, going to be a tough one. Who's going to be on the council? What can they decide? And what's the difference to the UN and, and so on and so on. But clearly, this is something that we have to define and figure out which way do we need to go forward. Um, so when we talk about the future, this is one of the key things that people get confused. They keep asking me about, you know, many organizations, what will the future bring? But this is not the key question. The future is not what will the future bring, as if a future was falling down on us or something. Right? It's not. This is the key question. What do you want the future to be? What kind of future do you want? What kind of future do you want your kids to have? What kind of future do you want to leave behind to your kids and your grandkids? What kind of future are we, are we designing? Because the future is malleable. The future is made by us and the future is not decided by science and technology but by our values and our ethics and what we want to get out of it. Hopefully the future will not be designed by our economic desires and desires for progress uh, on the financial side. So, great example, of course, is Facebook, right? What do we want our future to be? Well, Facebook is inadvertently kind of shooting at democracy, not by design, really, but by the fact of how they have designed their system and what is possible using this powerful system. And this is why I think, you know, we need to think about what we want from this future, for example, in social media, uh, radicalization versus collectivism. Do we want a collective society or do we want a radicalized society? Do we want to monetize or do we want to have conversations and meet each other? Uh, do we want loneliness that we have on the internet in spades? You know, the most lonely people in the world gather on the internet and the most suicidal tendencies, of course, are the power users of social media. Or do we want real togetherness? Do we want to live in a world where algorithms run the show? or androvisms, right? human things, intuition, emotions, imagination. What kind of world do we want? That's a decision that we're making. And that's a decision that we're making every day in government, in industry. And now in the next 10 years, this is the fork in the road moment where we're saying 10 years we have right now in front of us to design in such a way that we want our future to look like forever. Not just for those 10 years, but we're setting the stage climate change, artificial intelligence, technology, uh, business practices, and so on, because clearly this is the problem. You know, technology can be a present, and it is a present, and it can also be a bomb. Technology is morally neutral until we use it. It can be both, and we have to make sure that it stays 98% a present. We should not fall into the same uh, uh, problem area and the, into the same faulty solution uh, the same issue as they did with the oil industry, which was to say, yes, we have nice, you know, we have gas for our cars, but you know, the circumstances, the externalities were forgotten. And this is what we have now, right? Climate change, global warming. We need to make sure we plan for the externalities, the outside effects of technology to come into the business model, to be part of our design of the future. That is going to be absolutely crucial because now data is not just the new oil, uh, in many ways, data is also the new plutonium. Data oil is great. We can use that for all kinds of things, climate change, fighting diseases, uh, improving healthcare, uh, improving, of course, all of the fossil fuel conversion to uh, decarbonized society. So that is great, but plutonium also means your data can be used as a weapon. Social media is the best example. Uh, and the surveillance is the best example, a so-called surveillance economy. And again, this is the solution that we need to say, well, let's use data, but let's make sure we use it safely. We have standards, we have privacy, we have security, we protect what makes us human. And that is an ethical issue that we need to focus on. And I, I think that in the next couple of years, every company, every organization, every state that does not do this will lose out in the global competition because we care for a little bit more than just using technology for economic benefit as we have until now. We're going to redesign the internet and the cloud. Right? Everything is that we have goes into the cloud. Our banking, our money, cryptocurrency, uh, healthcare, everything is moving into the cloud because it's a fantastic benefit for us. But responsibility, accountability, security, 
right? Uh, ethics, values, regulation. We need to put the human back inside of the cloud. And as I like to say, we need to keep the human in the loop. Not take the human out just because it's going to be bigger and faster and, and make more money and more efficient. Yeah, we need to keep the human in the loop. Ultimately, humans should decide those important things using technology. Awesome humans on top of amazing technology. That is kind of our principle of the future. And as we move uh, into the present, or out of the present into the future, we can clearly see that technology is kind of an emergency just by climate change. You know, too much of a good thing is a very bad thing. Unless we act now, the unintended consequences of exponential technological change will equal those of the fossil fuel industry. In other words, we won't just have a climate change problem, we have a technology, a human change problem, as we are changing, impacted by technology. We need to balance on this, you know, have the benefit of it and control the negative side effects of it. Otherwise, our biggest current problem is not going to be that machines take over. They're not quite ready for that yet for another 20 years, but that we become too much like them. That we become machine thinkers, reductionists, uh, dataists, you know, who believe in data more than anything else. Humans don't believe in data in their heart. They believe in themselves. They believe in, in engagement and relationships. We just use data as a tool. Right? We're going to see, ex uh, and you can expect, uh, tidal waves of technology regulation in the next couple of years. Antitrust action, data privacy, digital ID initiatives, that is going to be essential. And I think Europe will be the key driver and many other countries around the world will fall into place. Like even in the US, that discussion is raging about the balance between humans and machines, about that handshake between humans and machines. That is what we need to accomplish. In a, in a way that's driven by ethics and values uh, and, and, and not just by economic benefit or by you know, this kind of concept that we're converging as this graph shows, right? Humans and machines are getting closer and closer. And that is primarily a good thing for many reasons. But as we use it, we have to define, this is not a black or white question. That's like saying if you don't like the, uh, uh, technology, don't use the telephone or the washing machine or the internet, no. This is a question about how exactly we use it, who is in charge, who makes sure we have the right balance, and who is accountable. And companies are not accountable, like Facebook and other social media companies, and clearly don't want to be accountable. You can't have it both ways. Yeah? If you change society, you are accountable. Very important as we look at our past, you know, we already had, as the Charlie Chaplin clip here shows, automation. Uh, turning people into robots and, and factories. That was a long time issue, but we, we dealt with that. And now we have the same thing with computing. Right? Computers are driving the same process of, of potentially dehumanizing it, but much faster. Automation is a much bigger force than globalization ever has been. And this is the primary thing. We need to not dehumanize, but rehumanize. We need to rehumanize technology, rehumanize everything around us so that we can use an ethical approach and a collective approach towards what I call the good future of humans. That future is going to be largely driven by science and technology, yes. But with what objective? What exactly do we want from it? How are we going to agree on it? How are we going to build a society that has collective benefit? We must take a holistic view of the world, a view that goes beyond saying, okay, jobs, growth, benefit, GDP, power. Right? That's what we had so far and the internet was driving that even more because technology takes, tends to make things more efficient. But with the approach of what I call the triple bottom line, riffing off people, planet, profit, I say people, planet, purpose and prosperity. Much better word than profit. Uh, prosperity, purpose. That is a holistic view that we're going to need from government, from our government officials from the CEOs of major company, from the Business Roundtable, from the World Economic Forum, which has taken a holistic view already and driving that forward into this great transformation of our world that is essentially fueled by the COVID crisis that we have right now. And, and uh, as a final point on this, we have to think about the role of money and the role of capitalism and, and the simple society that's just based on GDP, as John F. Kennedy, uh, Bob, Robert Kennedy said, uh, 1968, you know, GDP measures everything except for that which makes life worthwhile. We need to have a wider approach to this. You can't just be about that, right? It has to be about four things, people, planet,
purpose prosperity, as I was saying earlier, but you know, not just one bull moving forward into the financial markets, but a new design of stock markets. And that would be a fantastic opportunity. We already have a similar one in San Francisco called the Long Term Stock Exchange LTSE, to where I would put my money. Uh, People, planet, purpose, prosperity, that is the paradigm of the future. As we're growing in this world where data and information and computing and AI is becoming utterly crucial and is going to drive a lot of solutions and benefits for us, we need to make sure we zero in on this equation of saying, okay, we have smart machines, algorithms, and then we have what makes us human, the androrhythms, which I'm describing in my book, Technology versus Humanity, in great detail. Just Google for androrhythms. That's obviously a made up word, but emotions, intuition, compassion, imagination, mystery, values. That's the stuff that machines should not do or should not handle. Those are the things that make us human. Machines should have competence, not consciousness. Why do we want them to be conscious? We are conscious. We are doing all those things, emotions, creativity, ethics, empathy. That is what makes us human. We should retain that as being human and prioritize that at least on the same level than technological progress. We're putting that squarely in the middle of our policy uh, based on progress, always based on progress and productivity but with a little bit of precaution thrown in there. This is the key question. We will have all the tools and the tech we need in the next decade. We can solve disease, we can solve climate change, or at least we can tackle it and possibly reduce it. We can solve uh, water and food, we can do all that with technology, but will we have the telos, the wisdom, the purpose, great Greek word I love, tools and tell us uh, we need to have the right policy decisions when it's about democracy, when it's about technology, when it's about climate change, when it's about equality. Technology will not solve social, cultural, political problems and human problems. It will make them worse because technology is exponentially a driver of efficiency. And technology needs to be used in in, in a way that we can design what I call the good future. Technology is a tool and then we need to bring the right purpose to it. Technology is not what we seek, it's how we seek. And very important, the old Cherokee American Indian saying, you know, what really is driving the future is the wolf you feed is the wolf that wins. If you feed the wolf of capitalism, so to speak, only at the at the depend, dispense of anything else, this is what we're going to get. And this is our decision to figure out what exactly do we want in the future and how we're going to feed the future uh, to be happening today and how we're going to find a solution in this way. So this is why I think ethics is uh, exponentially important um, and it's going to be absolutely existential for us to keep an eye on this and to really focus on the Ethics Council and the role of ethics in every part of our society. Thanks very much for your time and attention and if you want to know more about my work here's the link futurewithgerd.com my book is at tech versus human, tech vs human.com, technology versus humanity. Thanks very much for tuning in. I'll see you in the future.